Chancellor Adenauer, face the nation. Through the eyes of CBS News and public affairs cameras in Bonn, capital of the Federal Republic of Germany, you are about to see the winner of last Sunday's West German elections, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, face the nation with unrehearsed and spontaneous questions from veteran American news correspondents. The 81-year-old chancellor scored an overwhelming victory to win his third four-year term as chancellor and an absolute majority for his Christian Democratic Party in the Parliament or Bundestag. Our cameras are located in the chancellery inside the same room where the German cabinet normally meets. The language problem has been overcome by simultaneous translation. Unseen and translating the chancellor's voice into English for both audience and reporters is his official interpreter, Heinz Weber. Beside Dr. Adenauer and translating the reporter's questions into German for him is Friedrich Krollmann. Both are German government officials. Asking the questions, Ernest Leiser, CBS News correspondent in the German capital, and Arthur Sylvester, Washington correspondent for the Newark News. And now, here is today's moderator, CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hotelet. Germany is the key to Europe. If all Germany, its people, their industry, the ground on which they stand, were to fall under Soviet control, all of Europe would sooner or later be dragged into the Soviet bloc. Now, in a free election, the 50 million people of West Germany have reaffirmed their solidarity as a democratic state <coughs> and as a partner in the North Atlantic Alliance. Chancellor Adenauer, you have just won the largest majority in the history of German democracy, a triumph for your policy and for you personally. But your country is still divided. The Soviet empire is on your eastern boundary and the Cold War is an everyday matter. The problems that lie ahead are, if anything, greater than the ones already overcome. We would like now briefly to examine how things stand. And for our first question, Arthur Sylvester. Mr. Chancellor, what is the meaning of your great triumph in terms of the development of German political traditions? Does it mean that the Germans are leading to the leader principle again, or that we are moving toward a two-party system in Germany? It, it looks as if we are on the way towards a two-party system, as in the Anglo-Saxon country, there is no question of a leader principle. Uh, Chancellor Adenauer, next January you will be 82 years old. By the time your term has run its course, you will be in your 86th year. Do you really want to continue working at this hard job that long? <coughs> the other day I was asked the same question. By representatives and journalists of German papers, I replied when Pope Leo XII became 90 years old and the diplomatic corps uh, congratulated uh, him on his birthday, and the dean of the diplomatic corps wished him that he should maybe become 100 years old. The Pope replied, why do you want to set any limits to the divine, to divine grace? Well, I replied the same to you. Chancellor Adenauer, why do you want to retain the burdens and responsibilities of the Chancellorship? Well, I tell you quite frankly, Mr. Hartlett, for the very reason you have mentioned right at the beginning in a different context, because in view of her geographical position and in view of its population, its industries, Germany is a key to Europe, and this key must be held till peace and order has been restored in the world, and that is the reason which prompts me to accept the shoulder of this burden in spite of my age. Mr. Chancellor, have you set for yourself any specific achievements by which you will consider your next four years successful or not? Yeah. Yes, there are different objectives. First, in the field of internal politics, 
We succeeded in the last elections to gain a considerable portion of the young working population vote, working people vote. And I would be pleased, and this is my objective, to see eliminated this partition into classes. You in the United States do not know what this means, but here in Germany it is a tradition. But in my opinion it is a bad tradition. That is one of the objectives I have set for myself, namely to remove these differences that one party is the representative of the working class population and all the other parties would be representatives of all the other classes. I do not want to have any particular party that represents any particular class. And in the field of foreign politics, I should like to make a contribution that the policy of the United States of controlled disarmament, the policy of peace, is be reinforced and supported by all the moral strength of the Federal Republic. And for this very reason, I was highly pleased and satisfied that this recent election resulted in an increase of the votes cast for the government coalition, especially for my party, the Christian Democratic Union, in spite of the fact that we have been in government for eight years. Dr. Adenauer, uh, it was a vote of confidence for your government, of course. It was an even stronger vote of confidence for you personally. Your followers showed a great deal of enthusiasm during the campaign. Some people say it was close to veneration. Are you worried about this attitude on the part of the Germans? Do you think that they were too willing to follow you? No, uh, I'm sorry. No, were I you as disturbed as some of the foreign correspondents who followed you were at the worshipful expression in the eyes of many of your followers? Well, that will be passing again. That will be over soon. That was just for the time being. But that will be over soon. But I wouldn't speak of worshipful eyes. I would say they expressed confidence and trust. And I admit that this may be a burden for oneself if you see such great confidence, if you feel it. That is not only joy and pleasure, it's only a burden because it implies greater responsibility. But of course it will also be my duty in the course of the next <coughs> four years to keep my party stable, independent of my own person. Can you name any representatives of the younger generation in German politics who, whom you consider capable of carrying on the policy that you have laid down? You shall never name a crown prince. That's absolutely wrong. To be sure, but uh, you did campaign with, uh, on the basis of having a group of people who were qualified. Well, that, that's right. Well, I campaigned with a full team of able men. And it is also my idea to make younger people participate in this work. I should like to say and make another point. In all my rallies and meetings, I have had 47, 48 or, or 49 rallies. More of 50% were young people, those in attendance. And that was great joy and pleasure to me. That was not the case in 1953 and back in 1949. And I think uh, you are justified in expressing the hope that uh, over the years the Germans have, have shown common sense, politically speaking. Uh, Chancellor Adenauer, 
What do you feel has attracted the young people to you and to your party? What have you done that makes them in so interested in you and your party? Let me put it in simple words. I think it was the conviction which when itself when when self feels in all my speeches let me make this point i always got great applause if i refer to the when i refer to the gratitude germany owes to the united states and i think the people, the great mass of the population, were very moved by that, and they were always in full agreement with me that there is an obligation to show gratitude, also in politics. How would you explain that, uh, Dr. Adenauer? In almost any other country of Europe, we must speak frankly, uh, this pledge of allegiance to United States policy would, would be the ruin of a political leader. Yet here in Germany, it seems to have been uh, wise politics, and uh, I wonder if you can give us the reason for it. I wondered myself what the answer to this question would be. And I think here in Germany, there's great understanding and sympathy for the American himself, for his character, for his way of life, for his nature. More understanding than in many other European countries. I wonder if we could now turn to one of the problems that uh, we are lying ahead, the problem of rearmament. Now that the election is over, uh, are you in a position to intensify your efforts to fulfill your obligations under NATO? This morning we had a cabinet meeting and we discussed this very question and we will fulfill fully the obligations we have undertaken vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Chancellor Adenauer, in view of the great prosperity in Germany and the fine financial position of your government, is it likely that you will take over more and more of the financial burden of defense than in the past? Please may I ask you not to overlook one factor. You must, must not be conceived by the foreign exchange accumulated by the uh, German bank. And this is what I should quite a some quantity of what I would call flight capital, and you cannot make this the basis of um, economic recovery. And I mean, it's very difficult to differentiate between what is uh, good and solid capital and what is not capital of such a safe and good character. In no way do we want to withdraw from our obligations. We know what our obligations are, and we know that they must be fulfilled, but we will have to face problems, other problems, one of which is a shortening, reduction of working would, hours. Would you... If you had a, a heavier arms burden, would, you, would Germany then not be in a less favorable position to compete in the world market with goods from the United States, from Britain and elsewhere? I think that will completely depend on the development of our economic situation. I think we could shoulder the greater burdens in rearmament if we have a corresponding increase of our economic activities. That means if we 
can enlarge our exports, but not all of our friends like to see such a development. Do you then not intend to revalue the mark upward? No, no. Uh, Dr. Adenauer... No, we don't think of it. Uh, Dr. Adenauer, in just three months, you are going to be faced with a, an urgent military decision. At the year-end meeting of the NATO Council, the question of atomic armament for the NATO powers, including Western Germany, will be discussed. If it is a decision of the Council to equip the West German Army, the Bundeswehr, with atomic weapons, are you prepared to accept that decision? We will see to it that our forces are being equipped with the best weapons. And I assume that that is an affirmative answer. The best weapons are tactical atomic weapons you consider? I should like to say, since there will also be German listeners to this interview, we are in favor of controlled disarmament, I said this already, but as long as we haven't achieved this objective yet, our troops must be as well equipped with weapons as our potential enemies. Dr. Adenauer, there seems to be a view among your German officers that a large foot army is outmoded. Uh, have they brought that to your attention and, and does your last answer reveal and suggest your thinking along that line? No. We also need a conventional army, conventional weapons, because we have this iron curtain, and there may be some attack which may be defended by conventional, with conventional weapons, and we might require these uh, conventional forces in order to prevent an atomic war from breaking out. Chancellor Adenauer, your relations with the Western world are very well regulated, but um, you also have an Eastern boundary. And certainly now, in the next four years of your term of office, the problem of Germany's relations with the East will come to the forefront. At this moment, the declaration by Marshal Tito and Mr. Gomulka of Poland that they accept the oder line as a permanent boundary, and Tito's statement that uh, you must also uh, concede the existence of two German states poses you with a, with a very special problem. Will you now, under these circumstances, extend diplomatic recognition to Poland? May I ask you a question first? Do you think that uh, what Tito says is absolutely authoritative? Well, I think it is certainly meant as a serious political statement. Of course, he is not in any position to, to, uh, to carry it out. Well, I think you are evading my question. Do you think what Tito said decisive. is decisive? But what Gomosa so says what? along these lines may very well be. Is that decisive? He is one of the two people most immediately concerned. I've always said we will never wage a war for the Odenise line. We'll never do that. But I could think of a development which would lead to a situation where in a united Europe this question could also be solved. I have always emphasized this right to one's home country, to the place where one was born. I've never said anything more going beyond that. But if you ponder this problem, someday in the future, all this area, Upper Silesia, uh, will have to be integrated into the area covered by the coal and steel community, by the common market. All the political boundaries which we have now will increasingly lose their importance and we will will have you now to find a, a solution. Will you now, as a first step, uh, uh, extend diplomatic recognition to the Warsaw government? Uh, I think uh, in doing so I would not be disturbed by the statement made by Gomulka, Mr. Gomulka. 
but I do not know, know whether in this way you would harm, do harm to Gomulka or whether you would help him. I think you would have to start with closer trade connections, commercial relations, and then you will have to proceed step by step. Chancellor Adenauer, could any public man in Germany announce that he had given up the hope of recovering the territory beyond the Oder Neisser and survive politically? What do you mean by areas in the east? The east of the Oder Neisser, the old territory. Only what is east of the Oder Neisser line. I repeat, we must, uh, this right to one's home place, home country, must be recognized. These people must have a chance to return to these places and areas, and the economic integration into a greater unit must also be achieved. And once these two problems will have, sol will have been solved, and in this way a relaxation of tension will have been brought about between Poland and Germany, then I am trustful that a settlement can be found. I am not of the opinion that in difficult and delicate questions like this you should make rigid predictions. But what is needed is patience and calmness. What do you mean by the right to one's homeland? Right to one's homeland, to me, means that people who were expelled from these areas must be entitled to return to this land. Dr. Adenauer, is there any reason to believe that in the next four years we can make any better progress toward reunification than we have in the past? I think there are such chances. You see, the Russians have waited for this election, and they have taken great pains to influence them in their way, in their favor. But now they have noticed and seen that they, the Germans, are not prepared to do the will of the Russians. And I can very well imagine that in the coming four years, Russia will come to realize this and will wish to live on good neighborly terms with us, as well as Poland, if the Western world pursues a sensible policy and if the United States policy, which the United States have began, I think disarm, uh, control disarmament is a very sound and good policy, then I think we will make progress in all these fields, considerable progress, in the course of the next four years. Uh, Dr. Adenauer, I'd like to return to uh, your comments about the oder Nysa border. You've uh, given us a new idea to think about. Uh, do you think that if the Polish government, or a government of Poland, granted this right of Germans to return to their homeland, uh, do you think that your country would be prepared to accept the oder Nysa border as a final political border? I have also made a second point. I said the right to one's homeland and the integration into a greater economic unit, for example, as the coal and steel community or the common market. Under these conditions, I could imagine that this political question could easily be solved. You must understand, I do not say this and after this that and so on. One cannot make any clear predictions, but you can just initiate a certain type of development and in my opinion this development must cover this right to one's homeland and the economic integration into a greater unit and then the political questions will solve, them, solve themselves. You said, uh, Chancellor Adenauer, that the uh, Soviet Union might now, in the face of this clear mandate given you by the German people, alter its own position toward Germany and toward the West. 
Do you think that a four-power conference in the near future might be a good way to explore if this change has begun in the Kremlin? Not yet in the immediate future. In my view, there's some unrest, some fermentation in the Soviet Union, and first of all, there is this Hungary resolution passed by the United Nations, and then there were the elections here in the Federal Republic, and these, in my opinion, were two very severe blows that were dealt to the Soviet Union. So I think we should grant them some time to recover. Chancellor Adenauer, do you see in the future the possibility of a division and, and divisions between Red China and, so, and the Soviet Union? In other words, are there natural antagonisms that can develop? I ask that question because I notice a trade mission from West Germany has gone there, and I'm interested in what your attitude is. I think that between Soviet Union and Red China, things may take a course in future which may give rise to concern in the Soviet Union. The population of the Soviet Union is 180, 190 million people. The Chinese have more than 600 million people. There's a considerable birth rate in China, and I know from very important Russian politicians that in long-term policy, 10 or 20 years, they are somewhat afraid of this development. And as regards our delegation sent to Peking, we didn't send them officially. I do not think that this uh, delegation will be very successful. Wouldn't it be better to have relations with Red China and exploit these differences than to ignore them, in view of your answer? That's a very tricky and very delicate, difficult question. Now, what is the situation? The Chinese put up very high demands on the Russians because of industrialization. They want to get quite a lot of things from them. And if you read a book on today's China, you will see and learn that the Soviets supply a great lot, have to supply a great lot of commodities to Red China. If other countries ship considerable quantities I'm of uh, terribly sorry. goods... Our time is up. I've got to break in. Thank you very much, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, for coming here today to face the nation. And thanks, too, to our panel of newsmen, Ernest Leiser of CBS News and Arthur Sylvester of the Newark News. This is Richard C. Hotelet. We invite you to join us again next week for another edition of Face the Nation. This program has originated in the cabinet room of Chancellor Adenauer's office in Bonn. CBS Television has presented Face the Nation, produced by Ted Ayers and filmed in Bonn, Germany, with Robert Hess from New York, Cyril Bliss, London, Jerry Schwarzkopf, Frankfurt, Harry Janssen, Berlin, Frank Binney, London, Gernot Anderley, Frankfurt, and Beryl Denzer, Washington, all of CBS News and Public Affairs. Today, on this CBS Public Affairs program, you saw the Federal Chancellor of Germany, Dr. Konrad Adenauer, face the nation.